Hi, everybody. Oh, yeah, it's working. Hi. Hello. Thanks for coming. Hi, I'm Heather Bandari from Visual Arts. Thank you to Leslie and Olanda and Christine, where are you, and Winnie for making all these lectures happen. It's been a great semester so far. Um, I am so happy to introduce Jean Shin. Um, I have known her for a long time. She was one of the first emerging artists that I worked with when I moved to New York. And she, I remember scouring, you just watched the umbrellas. I remember scouring the streets of Manhattan looking for broken umbrellas for Jean. And now even to this day, when I see a broken umbrella on the street, I think of Jean Shen. So Jean, thank you for that. Um, a lot of artists talk about their use of banal objects in their artist statements. A lot of artists talk about everyday objects being transformed or immersive site-specific installations. They also talk about involving community. I can tell you that Jean Shin's work truly transforms everyday objects. She truly involves her community in the process. And I know from experience that her exhibitions are actually site-specific immersive experiences. It is the why and the how that she does these things that I invited her to come today. And I'm excited to hear what she has to say. Uh, Jean's work has been widely exhibited in over 150 major museums and cultural institutions, including solo exhibitions at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Fabric Workshop and Museum in Philadelphia, the Smithsonian American Art Museum in Washington, DC, the Scottsdale Museum of Contemporary Art in Arizona, the Crow Collection in Dallas. Her works have been on view at the New Museum, the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, Museum of Fine Arts Boston, Asia Society Museum, the list goes on and on. Also, she is an accomplished practicing artist in the public realm. Um, and she has realized large scale permanent installations commissioned by major public agencies on the federal level, as well as city and arts for transit programs. She recently completed a landmark commission for the MTA's Second Avenue subway station, which is beautiful. Um, please welcome me and in, in welcome, please join me in welcoming Jean Shin. Oh, and I want to make one other announcement. This is being recorded. So when we get to the Q&A section at the end, we're going to be passing around a microphone. So wait for the microphone to ask your questions. All right, thanks. Thanks so much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I especially enjoy, um, I'm also an artist and educator. I teach at Pratt Institute, and um, I love going through uh, uh, the studios in particular. So I appreciate uh, visiting some of the artist studios today before this lecture. Um, I wanted to mention that as an artist, um, especially in a school setting, that I majored in painting when I started. And I was doing figurative um, works um, and also painting the landscape. I mentioned this because in my undergraduate, you wouldn't believe that I you know, had done pretty much painting and by my senior year, like creeping, creeping a little bit off the wall. And then by the time I uh, left school, this was one of the first major installations I did. So I owe this installation really to teach me how to do installation work. Um, this um, work is called Alterations. Um, I'm standing here barely slightly above this uh, laptop, which is a very low podium. Um, and that's part of the, uh, the kind of learning curve on this material. These are pant cuffs that have been removed from myself and a lot of other um, participants, I call them. Um, but basically, it's the measurement of the body. And of course, when you're doing figurative work, you're looking at proportion and anatomy, and you're really looking very precisely about um, how it, the difference of the proportion and the units. And I thought, what a perfect unit, a unit in a, of an equity, in this case, of your own height. And being Asian American, we're all pretty much petite, although the next generation seems to have gotten it right. Um, so <laughs> I was thinking about like that exact measurement that you know of your body, that it doesn't fit the standards of fashion. So these were all um, heights that didn't exist in the world, it wasn't needed. Um, and so I gathered them. What it also did was bring me out of a painting studio, the place where I was like, I have to be in my studio all the time. But in this case, I couldn't be in the studio all the time because I had to go around to the corner alteration shops all over New York City and um, hustle my wares, my materials. So I couldn't just go to the art supply store. I literally had to 
um, negotiate my materials. And of course, the beautiful hegemonies and you know, the Korean um, were like my aunts, and they would immediately speak to Korean uh, with me and say, "What do you want?" <laughs> you know, and they were like, "Discount." I'm like, "No, no, I don't need a discount. I actually would like to get." your remnants. So it became a way for me to work within my community, one that I didn't identify necessarily with just around the corner. But of course, inevitably, when you travel across the country, you're like, oh, you're Korean. Oh, you know, a great dry cleaner around the corner. And so it was like kind of the two worlds colliding uh, in this one piece. So my work often takes me to places that I don't imagine. And this is one of the classic pieces. It also brings my friends and my colleagues. I was collecting umbrellas. And so whenever there was a broken umbrella Back in the phone days, people would call call me on the corner, of Prince and Houston. You should come over because everyone's just dumping umbrellas at a really big storm. And so, this was a, a found object, you know, kind of um, call. So I had this idea of rescuing these umbrellas, and it really was sort of looking at the tragic umbrella, the body broken and abandoned. And I thought I would rescue them um, and re-sew them, mend them, and create these new installations that would be introduced to the landscape in a new way. Uh, so they became canopies, as you saw from the video. They really are kinetic. Um, and again, the work taught me how to become an artist. So I was sewing these uh, like re-hemming every single piece um, to make them strong and resilient to the wind and the sunlight. But in fact, I had no sense that I was making kinetic works. They move, they breathe life with the wind. And so that kind of sense of um, um, fluidity and its um, response to the environment was something I had not expected in the work. So all that taught quote, a painter, something that is beyond one's control. And so installation has been always that kind of um, looking for something that I couldn't imagine and learning from it. Um, so I do a lot of site-specific work. And so whenever I have a new site, I kind of take on the new challenge. So as an emerging artist, this is my first solo show, the Museum of Modern Art. Big challenge. So I said, well, I'm no longer interested in doing like found installation, found objects. I was like, are they being found or could I also jumpstart this and say, well, how come I can't just ask people <laughs> to give me things that they would all otherwise be left behind? Um, so in this case, just like having Heather be my ambassador saying, and my friends being, if you see a broken umbrella, call me. So here I just asked the curator to um, be my ambassador. So that so I wanted to map the invisible community that works behind institutions, just like Brown, like all the lovely people that I'm going to meet today, you know, are doing the work, right, to get these fabulous things to happen. And museums are just the same. Even a big institution like the Museum of Modern Art has all these people working behind the scene, the registrar, the art handler, obviously a curator and director. But these are worlds that are have full of hierarchies. They don't all get along. They don't all fit in one space even. And so I wanted to create um, a place where the body seemed broken, but also coming together harmoniously. So my work is sort of like a fiction in some way. It represents the reality, but I take that reality and literally transform it into something that actually doesn't exist. This beautiful wall where all of MoMA staff can just be waiting for you. That does not exist. Um, so th this is another site um, from going to make these large scale installations, um, one of the museums, but also a lot of nonprofits in the beginning. So the federal government had asked me to make um, a project in the permanent level. And it just dawned on me that um, I was making ephemeral installations, and it was really a challenge for me to transfer um, that kind of way of working, and I'll show you more works that are even more ephemeral than this, these bodies of clothing. But so I went back to the figurative um, works. The clothing was always a, a sense of representing the figure, just my, like my background in painting. So here was the federal building, and so the users were the naturalization and citizenship was one of uh, the major components. Um, and the other was the federal um, uh, veterans um, uh, uh, services. So it conflated the two because I thought, what an interesting community where the two, the first of becoming citizens and the other um, really in service to their citizenship and their country. So um, this again became a way where I thought, well, how do I get tapped into that community to have a material exchange, uh, something personal, like an article of their clothes? So uh, the veterans 
obviously the services know who they are so they could reach out. So we had a call for their uniforms. In previous works, I've done that with the veterans where it was a bridging of trust where I would meet the veterans one-on-one -on -one and um, ask them for their uniform. Then other times in a situation like a bureaucratic system, they're like, we don't really know where they get the paperwork, but once they have it, they come to the day of the paperwork's approval, which is the citizenship day where they're taking their oath. So here's a chance for them to say, well, you can address them, ask them whatever you want to participate in the project. So here they were, and I was thinking, that's my only chance. I'm going to get up to the podium just like it's not an artist talk. They're there to get their citizenship, and I have to come up and say, hi, welcome. Well, <laughs> you know, and what I understood by that was I was sharing my own history. In fact, my parents had gone through the same building to get their citizenship. So I was telling them, as a daughter of an immigrant, that the federal government had asked me, an artist, to make a public work that was going to be permanently marked in this building, and that I wanted to make that about them um, and their entry to this country and their commitment to this country. And so I asked them for an artist clothing. And um, this man, he's from Greece, he gave me the, his shirt right there and then. <laughs> and he literally just said to me, like, I, my life is so busy. I'm going to walk out that door. I'm going to celebrate my family, and I've got to go back to work. So I'm going to forget that you asked me to do this amazing thing and gave me the opportunity to, you know, be part of this big uh, memorial in essence, this marking of history for me and my family and this country. So he gave me his shirt. Thank God he wore an undershirt that day. Um, and then, of course, veterans gave me uh, their uniforms, and oftentimes they include photographs of when they were actually fitting and in service, um, as opposed to the now. Um, but there is a kind of a parting of um, an article of clothing that they feel was so personal and so um, uh, full of memory of their experience and their identity. I took these kinds of projects um, elsewhere. So this is a commission by the Asia Society Museum. And um, they wanted me to make a site-specific work, but it was a traveling exhibition, so it would move across the country. And I was like, how do I make something site-specific? And then it, the site keeps changing. <laughs> and the community keeps changing. So I invented a project that actually would be about that. It was a particular show um, curated by Asian Americans mapping the terrain of Asian American contemporary art. So I took that as a signature. And I asked them to give me a sweater. Um, and then I would get a sweater to unravel. And then I would create the network in which we were all connected. And this is pre-Facebook and Instagram, where we don't know who, who knows who. And I really was inspired by looking at this um, very, very informative um, city um, that Calvino had written about. And instead of making an exchange um, of goods, they would tie a knot with whoever that they were having and kind of like, you, I need bread, but I need the house built. You'll build the house, I make you bread. I need my kids in, a, in a school, you, you can be my teacher. You know, So all of these kind of exchanges and relationships that you would have with your community were represented by a string, a string in space. And of course, then our comp relationships get very, very complicated, interwoven, and they have to abandon their city and move to the next one. So as people move from New York City, where the show was open, and we went to the next city, like Houston, I would invite other Asian Americans from that community to reconnect with the networks there. Um, so, th so the the installation gets built on site, it gets dismantled, and then reintroduced to a new city. So these are all my unravel sweaters and the threads just waiting to be installed again. And then the local community, it becomes my labor in which they reenact the building of this hive, this building of this community once again. So every person who gave me a sweater Sweater, they tell me who they know, and then we reconnect their thread to every single relationship. So some people know maybe a handful, five to 10, and others who are the critical curators like Christine Kim or um, the curator at the Hirshhorn, you know, like she, they know pretty much everyone in the art world. So their sweater gets moved around 100 plus times within this installation. Um, so in some way, it's a real mapping of an invisible network that's very, very active and continues to grow. And I've been with this project for many years. I just recently installed it um, at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Um, 
with a curator I met only through the project because she was Korean American. And so it really um, kind of the art changed how I knew my own community. It wasn't just a mapping of the community that existed. It actually activated that community. Um, I'm showing you these fabric works. These are some other works that are associated with clothing. And I'm always thinking about clothing as a launching pad to other things. These are shoes um, that have been flattened because I always think about our feet in relationship to like, what is this material that does so much for us? And these are shoes that have been de- um, commissioned, people don't use shoes that often, um, and when it's worn out, again, thrown out. So I was kind of saving these shoes and reconstituting them back to its original state, which is being like leather and being part of our animal skin, um, and how strange it was for us to take someone, some other animal's um, skin and apply it to our own um, for fashion. So these were the kinds of early thinkings I was ha having and kind of a skilling myself to be like the opposite of a cobbler to, you know, just like, a, like not a knitter, but I was an unraveler, you know, things like that, that anyone could almost do, uh, but do it in an extreme sense. These are some recent works that I did in a residency where I was um, getting scraps of leather from the fashion industry. And so I kept being curious, like, oh my God, I know those leather pieces that remind me of that hide piece that I made earlier with shoes, but then what are these forms? Um, and I realized it's really the fashion industry's discard. And what they were kind of hiding was the, the cow. They didn't want us to imagine the shoes related to an animal. <laughs> they didn't want us to think about the toxic tanning process and where the industry um, fashion chain leads us in parts of Pakistan and India and all the places removed from high fashion, removed from the fancy stores. Um, so I was sort of decoding and mapping uh, the discards to bring together the body once again. It's not our body, but it really is a consequence of our decorating our body. So, so, so a lot of the works that dealt with my own measurement and my own body and my community's um, body ended up taking on these environmental impacts. Because when you look at clothes, where it comes from, it really has an impact globally. So um, I've been really shifting my gaze at how you can look at one article of clothing and then follow it everywhere. Um, this is a project I did collecting uh, denim, and so it, again, had a familiarity with my first installation with alterations. Um, here it's the whole pants, and I was making um, them functional. So here, instead of being pants, um, what's needed to protect ourselves from the, um, current environments or through hurricanes and floods um, are the need to have sandbags readily available. Um, but sandbags are often too heavy to move, uh, not available when you need them. So this was kind of the intimate way in which communities can come together and build a wall of resistance to our environment um, through climate action. Um, so that's kind of a quick run through of what I um, sort of curated around uh, my works with fabric. Um, I also want to show you other discarded materials that I've used, um, inspired by. Um, typically, it starts on my normal commute. So these are a lot of tickets that I would see um, spewing on the streets of Brooklyn. <laughs> so in any given day when I walk from home to studio, I would see dozens of this and thought, man, if they were dollar bills just floating around, I'd be um, rich. Uh, instead, they're, of course, always losing tickets. And so the idea of like being a loser for, versus my embedding like the thought of like, oh, if I could just pick them up for its true value. And it made me question what is the true value of anything here. Um, for me, the losing lotto ticket was very symbolic of like uh, wishes, you know, failed dreams, but like the next one's coming. Um, and I realized very much that as I was going to the studio imagining the work I would make, it, it sim had a similar idea of gambling and risk. Um, we all know as artists, if you ever become and decide to go in that field, there are a million people who tell you, oh, that's just a 
a dumb dream. You know, it's not worth it. Most artists are never going to make a career of it. They're never going to get money. They're never going to sustain their life. What are you going to do for a day job? You know, there's just all the naysayers telling you not to do that work, right? So I felt like um, it was the same kind of impulse. These cities are not glued. So they're just, again, assembled on site. So here's one of my assistants after having recreated this many, many times. She begins by stacking one card at a time. So when someone says, how did that happen? It's like, by putting in the time every day and every day and every day, you know, there is the possibility that it will all collapse. And I say, and that is fine. That's what I expect. But after so much redundancy, actually, they stay up. And after so much of being careful <laughs> to do the work and to follow your dreams, but also to the, the labor, um, things do happen. And I felt like making a city is very much like that, coming from New York City, where everyone comes from elsewhere with their dreams hanging out. Um, and the reality of that is full of resistance, not through practical uh, a gaining of risk, you know, because then people will say, don't do it. <laughs> don't come to the city. Don't follow those dreams. Um, I, I also think about the vo body as very vulnerable, and, and so this idea of the pant cuff as being imperfect and exactly my height is what I'm thinking of. And so these are prescription pill bottles, similarly. Like, all of us feel like we're all human, and being human also has these augmentations, how we change our chemistry to be normal, you know? Um, so these are prescription pill bottles that really map what's happening um, in, in the chemistry of our um, existence. Um, um, and how that's full of dependencies, um, full of chaos as well, and um, remedy and healing as well. Um, other projects where um, I think about objects that have been devalued very quickly. Um, so technology is another thread that goes through my work because we're constantly consuming and throwing away technology. So um, I feel like as an artist who's looking for resources and, and materials to work with, uh, can never go wrong with uh, technology because it goes obsolete so quickly. Um, so in this case, um, I was thinking about music um, production and how as a visual artist, the, the distinctive um, uh, you know, place that performance exists um, that is different from visual arts, that it is constantly moving and fluid and, um, and seems to kind of encompass a certain kind of heightened experience at the moment. And so I wanted to create a sculpture that matched that. So these are 78 records that I've melted and created a big kind of tsunami-esque like wave. Um, it's also thinking about how we're all connected to the generation in which our music holds us, whether it's the Walkman or the CD or the vinyls. Um, this, this collection actually came from um, my in-law's grandfather who had passed away, so it was like one person's musical collection. And I thought that was also impactful to kind of try to uh, preserve that. So, so much of my work is trying to resist the temptation that they can all be thrown out, you know? But when when something is possible to hold, um, I think it has um, kind of a, a place in our imagination of what a person might have been listening to, one person, not a whole generation. Um, these are other collaborations that I've done. Um, I mentioned that I did an exhibition at the Fabric Workshop Museum, a really amazing institution that not just presents artists' works, but works with them. Um, so they, again, the work allowed me to learn, and so learning collaboration, that I can't do things alone. I need a lot of hands for transforming the work. Um, so these, um, I made a textile, and this was actually a time when I was pregnant, um, venturing into motherhood and the balancing of being an artist, and I realized the time that I had to concentrate was at night, uh, and I couldn't be in residence in Philadelphia from Brooklyn. So what I was doing was emailing at night what I wanted to happen during the day when everyone else showed up at work. So I realized that my Art production was a digital one and based solely on what I was tapping away in the middle of the night on this keyboard. And so my conduit was, it was I was so connected to that touch um, sensation of the keyboard. So I made a whole project just on that, the dialogue that I had with like with this intimate keyboard that was so connected to my body at a time where my baby was connected to me. And then the translation of that in a different time and space where the Fabric Workshop Museum would get my emails in the, in the next morning and go to work. So this sculpture really maps that dialogue. And so every email, we found a letter 
that mapped itself in recycled keycaps. So you could read the sculpture letter by letter, word by word, sentence by sentence, and kind of see how we talk to each other in making this collaboration happen. Um, I also wanted to show you sort of the behind the scenes because I did not make and responsible for all the work here. It really requires a lot of commitment from other people. So this was a handful of summer interns that the Fabric Workshop had put together and we made a whole alphabet sheet uh, collecting our letters and then they printed out all our emails going back and forth our archive of its own making that they were trying to find the letters for and we made this new textile um, technology goes obsolete some of you guys may remember this I love lecturing about this now in a slideshow do you know what that is <laughs> Okay, this new generation may not know exactly what we're looking at, but I know some of you guys are smirking there. Uh, as we move to the cloud, I just really wanted to talk about the obsolescence of slides, the 35 millimeter, uh, not the digital form. Um, I was um, ha happily the receiver of the Metropolitan Museum slide archive. Even the Met could not hold on to their slides and they need to move on after they digitized them all. So they sent it to me and a, a few other artists after the artist picked through it, I said, okay, you take whatever you want. I would like the rest of the archive. Um, I wanted to feel the weight of history and for to literally create an immersive installation for new audiences to walk through because it is not their permanent collection. It's really the exhibition history only mapped at a certain time period when slides existed. So it's this kind of performance, <laughs> so to say, um, when slides were active. Um, certainly my generation, we did a lot of slide duping and so on. Um, but it's also talking about the you know, institution's um, uh, memory and how fragile it is. Um, if they didn't miss a slide in their digitizing process, it's gone forever as that slide disappears. Um, other ideas of site-specific work I wanted to mention. So I get invited to different institutions, museums all over the country, and here I'm invited to Arizona. I'm sort of struck by the first idea, which is like, God, you have this beautiful mountain. And I'm sure people come to New York City and be like, oh my God, the skyscrapers, you know? So, so I was really responding to that vista, and I wanted to make sure I captured it. Um, and in the site visit, I realized people were taking the obvious idea. I was like, oh, well, you could do beautiful hikes, but you know also we mine the mountains and it's a really economic importance to us that we have access to um, the copper that's in our mountains. So I wanted to conflate those two things and find an object that held both. So these are uh, keys made out of brass that has copper in it and thinking about all the access to spaces and also the vulnerability of those spaces. This was at a time when um, people were literally building right to the desert, right up to the mountains in Arizona and then the high housing crash happened and they were losing these houses and become vacant. And I was like, oh my God, they carved the mountain to make these keys and now they lay empty. Um, so I was really looking at the topography that each of our keys have to distinctively open a key, which is like those mountains. Like everyone in Arizona knows from a profile which mountain you are, which if that's north or east, just like we would in a skyscraper. Oh, that's clearly south. Can't you see that building there? You know. And so this kind of notion of orienting ourselves through this material um, uh, specificity. Um, other projects, I had the great fortune of doing a project at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. So I was thinking about our national identity um, and thinking in terms of the tourists coming in to see monuments. And of course, I didn't quite believe in the, the white guys sitting with the big heads with the figurative sculptures. So instead, what was I looking at? Like, what's the most interesting monument to me? And to me, it was the National Mall. The National Mall was empty. The National Mall was not empty. It was meant to be filled by the desire of the future generation. And I thought like, wow, they saw that there was potential to keep things left undone. Uh, left undone for a purpose. And so I wanted to create a project that really was talking about that. And the intimate monument that I felt like we all had um, were these little trophies. And so going through um, a son who you know shows up to soccer practice, and like, you win a trophy. And I'm like, why does he win a trophy? He just showed up and like he didn't do anything, you know? But this notion that Americans love to like, you know, make it so dramatic, you win everything, you know? And so there was this kind of over, um, 
emphasis when we're really young that we're, we could be a star and so on. But at the end of the day, when we're actually adults and working really hard on the day-to-day -day things, no one is giving us any words or thanks or acknowledgement of the work that's done. And so there's this riding theme, of course, of immigrants, right? They're doing the bulk of the work every day, totally acknowledge that that work is actually even valued. And I just thought, like, why don't we switch that? So instead of this soccer, uh, this basketball player, he's a mechanic holding um, the tire, and the chef who's a karate master who's like really um, a cook. Um, and then this is what my studio looks like when I collect these objects. So this is my first like going back to figuration, but I was doing it in three inches uh, made out of plastic and sawing off their limbs and so I can transform them into new gestures of work. Um, and then this is honoring all the people who gave me their trophies, that so they um, are going back to the platform, the base becomes like the scale of the National Mall that I get to fill with them. So they become like miniature um, people who made that journey with me. Um, so that's a project about the everyday hero. Um, and then other sites um, that isn't really about a monument, but I also think in some way it has a, uh, that same conversation. Um, I was invited at Montclair Art Museum, which beautiful landscape, beautiful homes. And of course, beautiful homes always come with um, kind of the idea of the perfect um, um, surrounding. And so I was seeing these beautiful trees and I wanted to transform that tree uh, with the material of the domestic. So these are um, knives that have been bent and wel um, welded together to create that tree stump. Um, thinking about etiquette and tradition and all the things that are passed along in the home. Um, ideas of this kind of uh, a uh, perfect um, host, the idea of the family coming together, and how that really has been questioned today, where people are uh, all over the world, never having a meal together, if not holidays are challenging, uh, families are broken. Um, so just like the beautiful tree that can't really sustain itself, these trees, um, when you look close, kind of speak to the vulnerability um, as well as the, the beauty in that tradition. Um, the materials of the domestic have always been really important to me. Uh, this is a public art project um, in New York City, and it was an elementary school, and one of the sites was the cafeteria. Of course, I immediately gravitated toward that. So I asked the first class, the PTA, to give me one of their plates, thinking about the home, thinking about the conversations that a mother and father would have to their first children to kind of set the tone straight. And then off they go to school to see if that conversation would be developed in ways that are fundamental to the home and the mapping of identity itself. But this is how the community is also really, really different from the one that you grew up in. Um, the other public art projects that I've been doing, and occasionally I get to work on exciting sites that give me different ideas for a material. So when I did one at the elementary school, it made sense because for my son's school, the PTA is everything. The school doesn't function without PTA, the community. And so then I thought of a different site. This is in Flushing, Queens in New York. Um, it's a very high population of Korean Americans. And so I wanted to give back to that community a sense of identity that they already have. Um, but a material that really is also culturally specific. So these are Korean psilodon. Um, and as a Korean American, I know that um, I've you know, always see them in every museum, and it's something that all Koreans sort of take pride in because it has a certain evolution and a technique that was passed on through Asia, but specific to Korea. So I went back to Korea to speak with the Celadon makers. So this is a project where, again, the project leads me to places. So I went back to Korea, I spoke to the potters and um, talked to them about how it was that they were continuing this tradition of perfection, um, this tradition that is so difficult to do. And in fact, um, 40 to 60 percent of their production has to be thrown out because it is such a difficult process to work with and the double, triple firing. So in fact, even though those vases are beautiful, what really struck me was the landscape of discards behind their kiln. They were throwing mounds of their history, decades, generations of imperfect pottery that had to be hidden <laughs> because you couldn't leave a non-perfect vase to leave that site. And I just thought, what a shame. That's what I'm going to do. Take all the broken shards that 
whatever reason couldn't exist and bring them back into a new form. And in my work, they were mosaic, they're going to be broken, but it contains literally the hand, the mark, the glaze, the double firing, all the beautiful imagery of Korea. And then I would take this project elsewhere, this is in Dallas, um, and so at the Crow Asian Collection, we made a Zen garden with a local community and they got to know mosaic making. They got to look at Korean ceramics up close, uh, look at these fragments and kind of see the beauty in it and fall in love with Celadon, uh, just as I have. Um, so they, they sort of discover a big broken vase, a Korean vase that would never have existed outside Korea. Um, so I think about all these objects having many histories, one that is embedded with a maker and its rejection, but how I can then bring that conversation of discovery to new audiences that may or may not know anything about a Korean celadon. Um, I also think about the environment a lot. So there is a cultural artifact that um, lives in Korea with mounds of it, right? And then when it got imported to Korea, I was afraid that someone in uh, customs would say, well, what's the value of this two-ton box that you have? And someone would write Korean celadon, and then they would tax me for precious object, cultural objects. But instead, it's at value zero. It's going to New York. It's Korean celadon garbage that for some reason are coming to New York. Um, so I realized like, wow, that's so interesting. At one point it's so valuable, and another it's totally discarded and devalued. And so I was looking at um, Landscapes America. This is in uh, Louisville. And so they asked me to do a public art project and I got there and they have this beautiful river and they're known for the exchange along the river. But in the river um, is the waste that just comes from all the way up to Chicago, straight down to the south, and it gets stuck in their landscape. So after every flood, you see plastic just everywhere. And so my project just became, let's clean up the plastic because it's here and we should talk about what this landscape really is and could be. They also have a beautiful fossil bed, and so that was inspiration. Their fossil bed, these mysterious little creatures and looking at the cavities and imagining their lives. And I imagined a future generation looking, what are these weird yellow plastic things that they seem to have so much of it, it must have been so important. There's everywhere, you know, and it's embedded in their landscape, it's here forever, it must have meant something. <laughs> so meaningful in our cultural space. Well, it does, actually, um, but I'm questioning that um, impact. Um, this are some of the other recent projects. When I did that project, I actually thought that I would find a lot of white, uh, clear water bottles. That's kind of a New York thing, right? So wherever I go, lecture, here's a water bottle, here's a water bottle. So I imagined that to be true in other parts of the country, and it was not true. What I found was these green bottles, and I was struck, like, what are they, like, Perrier spring water? And they were like, looking at me like, why don't you know what the green bottle is? So I was like, Sprite? <laughs> you know, Apparently it's Mountain Dew, in case you haven't figured that one out. Apparently Mountain Dew is huge because it is the highest, you know, um, sugar, you know, um, intake that you can take. It's completely unhealthy for you. <laughs> and they call it the morning caffeine. So they drink it like coffee all day long. So I was really struck by that. And then I went to um, Iowa and I said they wanted me to do a project. And of course, I was known for the corn. So I knew I wanted to dress the landscape transformed by corn production. But then I asked them, do you guys also drink Mountain Dew? <laughs> and they said, absolutely. So I said, why don't we make corn stalks out of Mountain Dew? Consumed by them. So in fact, I calculated this landscape that I wanted to make, and it was like 12,000 uh, soda bottles. And I said, well, you can't get that. That's going to take like six months, a year to collect from their community. And so I asked them to do that. And they said, OK, let me, let me poke around, ask where we could get that, and how long. And I said, OK, we have it. Like literally that day, but got the response back. 12,000, you want them now? Got it. What, what next? <laughs> so the problem was much bigger than I imagined. Um, so then I took this project and we wanted to really talk about the body and the health. The relationship about how we treat our body is really indicative of how we treat the environment. And if we don't change one, we can't really change the other. Um, so I was looking at the consumption of soda bottles and um, working with children so they can say, ask that question, what are these, mom? Why do we have so many? And, say, and then to talk about the health of 
uh, drinking and consuming that many. So the project, the museum, literally went through every local school from elementary school to high school and made a jean shin a corn stalk called maize. And here's this weird hybridity that I trusted that I, it could be like bottle, like factory, but also feel organic. Um, and that I was really questioning their corn production because co their corn is not just for human consumption. It's really to make high fructose corn syrup that goes in processed foods. It's, and it's sort of like what Michael Pollan always says, um, every food, every DNA goes back to a corn in Iowa because it travels the world. Um, so I wanted to create this landscape in which we're surrounded by this product, as we are every day in our supermarkets, every day in our bags, every day in our foods, um, and that we would have to navigate this maze to try to figure out how to get out of this landscape if we don't think it to be um, healthy for us. Um, so it's kind of a, a collective call to action in many ways by making this together with the community. Um, I'm going to end with this last project um, so that I can open up with questions. Um, I feel very fortunate to um, be invited to um, work with New York City's MTA um, on the Second Avenue. And again, it's kind of looking at failed dreams in some way, a public project that should have happened 80 plus years ago that never did. Uh, so I looked at this material and the history of the Second Avenue that was uh, designed and ready to go and then never realized. So back in the day, they also ripped apart the Second and Third Avenue elevated trains before they went underground. And so I imagine if they had asked me then, and as many New Yorkers imagined, the subway was coming then in the 40s and 50s, they never got it. But that material is like, I would ask them, can, can I use that material? <laughs> um, the city's getting rid of it. Um, so I wanted to go to the archives and look at this complete transformation of the city when the elevator was uh, taken down and use the collages to transform them and bring it back into the city's memory as they travel to the site. So as they travel the new line, people will say, what, what are these? And some old timer will say, oh, those are the elevators. We used to ride those before we went underground. Um, similarly, in the photographs that I was looking at the city archives, I saw these beautiful New Yorkers captured in the photos. And I just thought, wouldn't it be amazing to bring them into the subway? They never got to see the Second Avenue nor ride it. And so I capture both the sky, because the interviews that I read, the cityscape had really changed. Of course, they were living literally under the dramatic shadows of the elevated. And when that lifted, people were finally seeing the New York sky and I wanted to bring that vision of the sky in the undergrad under underground since people will be going deep deep and, and not really experience the sky as we would know it then. I was also, again, creating a fiction. These people exist in a different time and space, and I brought them together. Like, this is not this woman, girl's grandmother. This is a, gra a, mother, a woman who just happened to be walking, and this girl who happened to be carrying her stroller by herself. Wouldn't happen in today's time. <laughs> But I just thought it was interesting to create the kind of update of what this would happen. Uh, ladies commuting to work, um, and I just thought they were just so beautiful to have them back, as we always do, waiting for transit. And of course, when you're riding the platform, um, what you miss is seeing this beautiful image of the sky struck of what I imagine in sunlight would look the best, you know? And so I uh, took those photographs and translated it with a glass fabricator to give literally the sky back, the city back. Um, um, when you have an underground tunnel experience in the subway. So that is my last image. Thank you so much. I could run through because I didn't want to miss the next lecture. <laughs> but I hope that there's questions for you uh, to ask them. Are there questions? You've worked on so many different projects with such a wide range of different materials. Um, can you talk a little bit about the professionals and maybe the volunteers, interns, who mm -hmm. you've managed to collaborate with a little bit? I mean, you've, you've um, implied that in, in some of the projects very directly. But in a massive um, mural project, the, the most recent, can you talk about 
the complexity sure. of working with a group of people like that? Yeah, so, so this last project with the MTA, it was four levels, uh, took seven years. I worked with three different fabricators. Um, two of them were new. One I've worked with um, for other public art projects who I love and love working together with. So I continue to work with when I find a great fabricator who really takes my projects on. He did my first Celadon project and he it was just amazing. So I continue, I mean, any pro public art project, I go to him first, you know, if he can, he's available or not. So it's trying to find um, someone who you feel like you can talk to, who can understand you. And his, he loves the challenge, because my projects are diff so different. Like one jean shim doesn't mean the next one is gonna be the same, you know, and he likes that. Whereas other people would be like, oh, how do I do that, you know? So it's kind of finding the right personality match, you know, and also the technician who's right on. So I really rely on the fabricators to have the technical wits behind them to be able to realize this uh, with me. Um, and then the other ones, I would say, of course, I work with interns and assistants. Um, many of them were my former students, so people who are coming from different schools, who I like kind of um, apprentice or mentor in my studio, and then they're available for projects all over the country. I just sort of call them up and like, I'm in town. Can I hire you for this month or a week, or can you fly out? And so I have a whole network of people that I feel like are part of my team team and it builds a community just um, so it really stays true to my projects. I do the projects, uh, I try to keep them local. Um, so a lot of the projects where I need hands, um, I try not to bring my assistants. I say, well, there's always local hands who need to make art with me. And so I tap into the universities and it's either through a, um, a professor who wants to lend their graduate students. Um, Usually there's some funding so I can compensate them, but it's an experience for them to work and it activates the local community and something that I do as an educator. Um, my students are go like, why can't we do that here in our class? And I'm like, well, I, I, I mean, they would fire me if I just did that. That would be the old way of like master or apprentice, you know? But in fact, this what I do with the local communities is just that. Like, it's not really about me. It's about them bonding together in the service of art. You know, uh, it just happens to be under the funding in my name. So there's kind of more weight behind what they're doing. But at the end of the day, I feel like their long-term friendships that they build locally will be more important, you know. And also they provide a local audience for the work, right? They bring their parents, they bring their aunts, they bring their teachers, you know. So for me, it's a way for the work to have a real true audience that matters, you know. Obviously it matters to me in a slide point because I want to realize the project for myself and my own community, but it really ha has a local impact that I want to stress. Um, and then um, as far as the other participants, um, that's a really incredible part of um, my practice is to ask people, invite them, um, for this material exchange. Um, so it's often something that resonates with them in their life, um, whether it's someone who works with that material every day so they know it more than I do, and then we become um, having a shared vocabulary on the importance of this material that other people don't share, right? Or it becomes a very specific, like a trophy, you know, and someone giving me that trophy and having many, many conversations over emails and phone calls about getting that trophy to me, you know? And so we end up sharing the stories behind that trophy and what it means to them. And so these participants um, really are kind of... Um, kind of, it, they become the subject of the work in some strange way. Um, and I like that uh, the project is an impetus for an, an activity that otherwise wouldn't exist. You know, they would sit there in, in a, a, an attic and no one would be thinking about them, right? But now they're thinking about, oh my God, I ran all those marathons. Or when I was a child, I played baseball. And, you know, so it's um, kind of playing on memory because these objects that have um, so much embedded lives and experiences to them um, are often forgotten. And um, so are those memories. There's a hand there. Um, so one of the most common complaint I hear from the public about art today is a lot of it, like conceptual, contemporary art, um, wouldn't be able to understand them. Mm -hmm. 
And I wonder, I'm wondering if you think about that or and how do you balance that? Like how do you make sure, because um, you use a lot of used object and some of it have history. So how do you make sure that message come across um, in the artwork? That's a really uh, great question. Um, I would say that you're, I'm, give, I'm sharing with you my intention and my process and all the behind the scene. I do not expect someone to get that when they encounter any of my works. Um, but I do expect some, depending on their familiarity with contemporary art, public art, or um, their own history, to be aware at different levels. Um, the reason I make um, works with everyday objects is because I want it to be as accessible, you know, in understanding some level of the message as possible, right? So someone um, who's drinking a Mountain Dew would be like, oh my God, that's a Mountain Dew bottle. There it goes. If somehow if they drink Mountain Dew, they're all over that conversation. They own that conversation. Those who are like, oh, I never drink soda and I'm a total health freak, then they'll own that conversation and go way off on that. And then some who's a corn farmer is going to go and talk about their experience. So depending on who you are, the convert, there's an open conversation. Is one person right over the other? You know, so it's all different, right? Your point of view—I can't change who you are, right? But by by pointing that, like, okay, so you've talked a lot about like soda, but what about corn? You know, and so it shifts the conversation to a terrain that they can then think about, right? So for me, it's a hybridity of all those experiences that I want to capture, and again, I, I want to probably question, but not know where it exists because I don't know, right? I'm just posing an installation that is coming out of the system that we live in, right? Which is there's a lot of sodas out here, there's a lot of corn being built. <laughs> What are we doing, right? Um, so, so I don't even imagine everyone getting the tier of like environmental action, right? Unless there's an environmental scientist, they totally know. Oh, and that corn, the runoff, the um, you know monoculture, that's a problem. And our, they just go on, right? So it really depends, and I'm very aware that for many people, it's just starting a conversation is helpful. And then maybe they'll say, oh, I saw this like weird sculpture made out of corn and, and um, soda. And then someone will say, oh, you know, it's actually the same byproduct, corn syrup. I'm like, what's corn syrup? You know, so I just assume that later on they'll have hopefully 10 other conversations, just like Heather's still thinking about my, the broken umbrella, right? Like forever she'll think about that broken umbrella and have many stories captured around that, even though what is that about? It's just the most accessible thing, right? So I do kind of think I keep the conversation very open so anyone can enter it whatever stage they're in. And if it stays with them, the conversations will build, you know? So I embed a lot of this um, conversation with my own politics, but the, it's not political. Right, but the politics is there for sure, you know. And if you know me, you know exactly what it's about, right? But if I go into Iowa as I did, um, a lot of the conversation was censored because, like, you know, we don't need you to tell us what to do about our farming. I was like, oh, I don't call it farming anymore, <laughs> you know. I was like, I've been very honest, but they were like, well, we don't like. Um, I don't. I think you're turning off our audience by talking in that way. And I said, then how would you like to talk about it? Could you like to give, like, I want to share that stage. Could you talk about your agricultural practices to your audience? Like, that's what I would be interested in, a deeper conversation about that, you know, because I'm not trying to impose my own or my lack of knowledge in it. I'd actually like the locals to talk about it, right? But it's a question and an invitation to share that platform because it's of interest to me and to find out what and how we are going to live with the corn um, industry uh, changing our landscape, you know? So those are the kinds of things. I don't expect everyone to understand where my agenda is and the quote, the larger message, because there's many tiers of it, right? Um, but I hope that it will activate where they might enter that. Thank you. Sure. I think we have time for one more question. Hi. First of all, um, thank you so much for doing this talk today. Um, this is really exciting. Um, I had a question, or I guess like more of an open inquiry, about um, your work as it relates to you know, the relationship in your work between your idea and the research that you do behind it. Because um, it seems like in a lot of your work, like for example, um, with the Ohio River with the plastic, a lot of it is inspired by the location and sort of inspired by what you encounter when you do visits. Mm -hmm. um, and I was interested if you could speak a little bit to um, 
how you come to you know, form an idea through research, whether you're looking for something when you come there or whether it just comes to you organically. Um, and how you work with like local community re research and like archival work, mm -hmm. right? Like Elevated has a lot of like archival elements to it. Um, and yeah, I would just like to hear you speak to um, that. So, bit. you know, I, when I was an undergrad um, at Pratt Institute, I s spent a lot of time um, working on the newspaper. So I taught myself journalism in a way like I was just interested in it, um, mostly th through ma making a magazine, but it, in, in essence, it tapped into kind of what I thought was a student activism, you know? Um, and so I would say a lot of my practice, what I'm doing, all the research, all the meeting people, all the site conditions, all the happen chance, it, it kind of is what a reporter would do. And I've realized that after the fact, it, though all my painting teachers were like, Jean, stop with the deadline on the magazine. You just got to go to paint, you know? And I was like, oh, that's too bad, but I have to finish this, you know? I, this the really pressing issue is coming out, and I have to spend time, you know, following up on that interview and blah, 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 and writing and editing and make sure I got it right. I realized that, that that was the training of an artist that I am today. I just, no one called it art. No one called it social anything, right? But I realized today when you asked me that question, I do the same thing a reporter comes. It's like, oh, I've been assigned this thing. We're gonna write a feature. What's the feature about? You know, it could be a highlight of something wonderful, but it also could somehow lead to like a conversation we didn't really intend to have, but it's here and it keeps coming up. Let me go look deeper in that. Oh, there's a whole history of that, you know. So of course I'll do the research beforehand, but until I get there and have conversations to see what people are really interested in, it taps them for me to talk to the next person or they'll refer me to talk to 20 other people or go check out this thing, you know. And then as you're there, you're making observations that seem self-evident too. And then you're like, okay, I need to look into that a little bit more. So I, I do find it's a little bit like investigative reporting. Um, but it's also like fishing, where you're just like, I know I'm gonna have to catch something, but you're just also waiting <laughs> to see when you know that your subject arrives and that hopefully you're ready to to capture it. You know, um, so that's kind of the process. It's it's a mixture of inquiry and being very interested and spending time and attention. Um, but I really don't know what I'm gonna get. Um, and to me, uh, that's why the projects are so varied and that's why I love doing what I do because I don't repeat that because the community is different and their interest is different with me. So it's a partnership um, in that. Just as I think that um, when a reporter writes an uh, essay, it's you're also thinking about what does this audience know? What do they want to know more about? You know, and what am I interested in pursuing in that? And of course there's voice too. You know, you just have to read between the lines sometimes. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. <laughs>